That's fine. I'm pretty easy. Hi everyone, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Carrie Wiggum. I'm one of the co-directors of the Institute for Genocide and Mass Atrocity Prevention, or IGMAP as we call it. And thanks so much for coming to our first speaking event, uh, our first guest of the year, uh, Jeffrey Parker, who's joining us from the um, US Holocaust Memorial Museum. Uh, I want to begin by acknowledging that we are sitting on the ancestral land of the Oneida and Onondaga nations. Um, so as I mentioned, this is the first of many events that we'll, uh, IGMAP will be hosting uh, across the, the, the calendar, the academic calendar. The next event uh, will be on Tuesday, October 11th, we'll be joined, we'll have as a visiting practitioner, Wahid Ahmad, who is an alum of Binghamton University's uh, public administration program. He was in the National Security Council of the government of Afghanistan uh, and is now displaced since the, the, um, the Taliban takeover of Afghanistan. But he's going to be speaking about that experience, his experience, uh, and what he's doing since then um, in trying to document war crimes and crimes against humanity that are happening in Afghanistan. That's Tuesday, October 11th at 4.30 right here. 
but today we are going to be hearing from Jeffrey Parker. Jeffrey Parker works in education initiatives in the Levine Institute for Holocaust Education at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum as a program coordinator. He leads the Holocaust Institute for Teacher Educators, which works with methodology professors and examines best practices in preparing teacher candidates to address the Holocaust in their future classrooms. Before joining the museum, Jeff taught high school English in the Finger Lakes region of New York for over 20 years and is currently completing work on a PhD in teaching and curriculum at the University of Rochester, where the main focus of his research has been in the area of Holocaust education. So please join me in welcoming Jeffrey Parker. Thanks, Jeff. Appreciate it. Can you all hear me okay? Yeah. I'm good. Former classroom teacher. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So as Carrie said, um, I work at the U.S. Holocaust Museum down in D.C. Uh, I currently work uh, through telework, so I'm able to be in western New York and go down to D.C. on occasion, so you know, make that uh, commute up and down, uh, you know, 15 pretty often. So just that I, I work with uh, college methods professors and pre-service teachers. Um, and you know, think about when they enter their own classrooms, how they can address the Holocaust, because it can be scary. Um, there's a lot of ethics and morals that get brought into it, and sometimes teachers don't feel prepared to enter into those conversations into their classroom. So kind of the way I explain to people is that most of the time I, I think about how we think and how we know is just as important as what we think and what we know. As Carrie said, I, I taught high school English for over 20 years in Western New York, up by the Rochester area. So during that time, a lot of things changed in education and society while some things remain really predictable. So one of the most predictable was the, the basic student understanding of the Holocaust. They're starting the unit off with a question along the lines of, what do you know about the Holocaust? The following narrative would inevitably emerge. Hitler and the Nazis were responsible for the Holocaust. They rounded up all the Jews and tried to kill them in gas chambers like Auschwitz, which according to most students was in Germany. People in Germany all were Nazis and they all hated the Jews, but didn't know much about what was happening and the Jews didn't fight back. But when the Americans entered the war, Hitler was beaten, everything was good. And you know, depending on the class, what was going on culturally, you know, sometimes Frank, or Schindler's List might get thrown in there. Well, from a factual standpoint, there are definitely misunderstandings here. The popular culture has elevated the Holocaust to a status that it removes historical proper context and renders it almost monocausal. The resulting problem lies in the linear, easily digestible story that while horrible in its implications, is at least manageable. The story allows us to think of the Holocaust as an aberration. Something that happened to those people over there way back when. It can be broken down to key events and roles that people play in discrete categories. Perpetrators, victims, bystanders, resistors, rescuers. These are somewhat accurate, but they're devoid of agency. As an English teacher, I'd say those are flat instead of round characters. Well, the simplistic lens grew as historians and social scientists try to explain what had happened in Europe in the years leading up to World War II, during the war, and the Holocaust. As the first wave of researchers gathered facts and details of the horrors, the need to document what was found led to a pragmatic creation of categories. As research continued, though, the facts were more completely documented and began to dovetail. It became evident that these categories were incomplete. As an example, how would one would approach this seemingly innocuous picture? So this is where I fall in the teacher category and ask, what do you see here? Don't be scared. I, I don't fight. Yeah? I guess it's a joke from the back of the teacher room, like a cabinet. Okay. Anything else? Excellent. <laughs> Some flowers. Yup. Little picket fence. 
See, I love it because that's where I start with the students to say, tell me what you see. I mean, you know, it's important to see, you know, to talk about what we see in images. So, yeah, we have a picture of a young girl. She's presumably wearing a swimsuit, standing outside a doorway. We see some nicely well tended flowers here. The building appears to be in good shape, right? There's a sign to the left of the window. The frame in the doorway, we can see a person stepping down. I hope it's a pool. So, student responses, though, are, are usually pretty apathetic. They don't see anything of interest here and can't understand how this has anything to do with the Holocaust. Say, so, let, let's translate that sign. Admission forbidden to Jews. So in the past, I often had students work with this along uh, the, uh, our beginning of a study of the Holocaust. They would interact with this along with a group of 30 or so photos and choose six of them to represent or define their understanding of what the Holocaust was. This photo, even with the translation, was never chosen as significant for understanding the history or how and why the Holocaust happened. Instead, students often gravitated to pictures like this. This is a shocking image. An older man sits on the edge of an open pit, seemingly staring at the camera. In the pit are several bodies. Behind the man is a uniformed soldier, holding a gun. Behind him are several other men in various uniforms. It's painfully obvious what's going to happen next. Yet, the men in the background all look pretty relaxed, as if this is a common occurrence. It's easy to see why this photo would be chosen to explain the Holocaust. It's visceral. It's terrifying. And as many of my older male students commented, the man holding the gun seems to be hardly older than they. But we have to ask, is this photo more important or more informative than this photo? Through continued examination, archival materials and records became increasingly evident that people in all facets of society were responding, behaving, and contributing to the discrimination and dehumanizations of the Jews in ways that were far more complex than could be explained by assigning static categories. People are active with complex reasons for doing things. Pressures, motivations, and fears, you know, some are evergreen, some are context specific, but they inform our actions. Nevertheless, there's this, this tension that exists between what historians know and understand how the public synthesizes that information, and then what gets condensed and crystallized and brought into classrooms across the country. As we challenge students to think more critically, it becomes obvious that Hitler and the other true-believing Nazis could not have carried out a crime on the scope and scale of the Holocaust on their own. They needed and found different degrees of help from ordinary individuals and communities. Pictured here is the deportation of the Jews from Lorac, Germany, on October 22, 1940. In this photo, citizens of a small town walk police lead Jewish men and women to trucks for deportation from Germany. Look at the facial expressions on the uniform men. Students comment that they appear to be disinterested. Looking beyond the individuals in line, they, students wonder, are they unwilling to make eye contact? The Jewish people in line appear resigned, with one exception, the woman in the middle. Her expression, is her expression one of defiance? Is it one of anger? Students will ask, and of course, we can't know. But if I exploring images and thinking about who these people are as individuals, we can see them having varying levels of agency in a very complex situation. So what do we see beyond the obvious, beyond those at the front? This is a very public scene. 
this was supposed to be seen. It's not night, it's not a dark alleyway, there's no subterfuge going on. This is public. Children peek from behind the line of deportees, while adults witness the event from the balcony above. Why would non-Jewish neighbors be here to witness this? Well, there are going to be many potential possibilities, which greater explanatory power than categories. Fear, opportunism, curiosity, conformity. Everyone else is doing it. I should probably do it too. Well, in this case, we have some evidence or, or some potential very powerful motivations. This photo was taken exactly one month after the deportation of Jews of Iraq. It shows an auction of household goods belonging to the former Jewish residents of the town. Although the large crowd of onlookers and buyers could not know in 1940 the German authorities would later murder most deported Jews, the auction signals to all present that they're probably not going to return. So how do people know about the auction? They didn't have Craigslist, they didn't have you know, phones or anything like that. Well, on November 22nd, this ad was in the La Rock newspaper. It's an announcement for an auction of goods at 29 School Street. This apartment had belonged to Jew two Jewish women, Franny Gunkin and her daughter, Marie. German officials had already deported the two German Jewish women to a detention camp in France. Marie was sent, eventually sent to Auschwitz, where she died. Franny survived. A neighbor later recalled the Gunkin family had a beautiful apartment school street. The apartment was very well furnished. Nicest of all was Marie's sewing machine. And yes, in the ad, a dressmaker's sewing machine was noted. So what motivations might have influenced people's choices to attend these auctions? We can make some important guesses. Material gain, greed, goods we had at bargain prices at a time of war and sacrifice. But taking a step back, though, we have to ask, how does the active participation of people in buying the possessions of the deported help us understand how and why the Holocaust happened? And how complicit were these people? And now we're getting to the point. By asking these questions, we've moved from static categories of people to exploring behaviors of people who had agency. By retraining our eyes, which are typically drawn to the center of the action, to the periphery, we see a broader, nuanced picture and can consider who is present and contemplate the, motion, the motivations and pressures that inform their actions. And before we go any further, let's make sure that understanding those <coughs> motivations, pressures, fears, and actions in no way excuses those behaviors. But by understanding them, we can ask these critical questions and get into those deeper levels of historical thinking. So you might ask, why is this important? For historians and researchers who want to understand the complexities of present history, it's a tool for exploring the past and understanding what had happened. In the classroom, though, I would argue the importance is elevated. We want students to be able to look at photos look at documents, hear testimony, read literature with critical senses and assess with historical thinking the behaviors of actions of people in a particular historical context. By assigning those categories, particularly that broad category of bystander, the nuances are missing and deep thinking about the past becomes a basic exercise of sorting people, labeling them, and ultimately forgetting them. So let's go back to our first image. Hopefully our considerations are at least a little more complex now. So some of our earlier assumptions are quite correct. This is the entrance to a swimming pool. The photo was taken in 1935, probably in the summer. This is telling because the Nuremberg Laws, which would strip citizenship from the Jews of Germany, was still a couple months away. 
So these early measures of social isolation and segregation were implemented by the community and weren't backed by any official legislation. This photo illustrates how the lives and communities of ordinary people were involved. What was the impact of local people identifying and segregating their neighbors? We know that for the most part, most German Jews were integrated into their communities. So the hope is that by urging students to widen their analytical lenses, they can come to understandings that encompass the fraying of relationships which isolated Jews from communities in which they had been previously integrated. And when provided more photos of exclusion and tools for greater critical assessment, students may ask that if Jewish neighbors were barred from entering, were the people complicit in discrimination by their mere presence at the pool? Now, these are questions that we don't have answers to, but they disrupt the narrative that it was all evil Nazis who were true believers who persecuted and murdered Jews and average people were in the dark. What about more complex sources for inquiry, such as testimony? So around the same time as the events in Lorac in October 1940, German authorities ordered all Jewish people aged 10 to 80 in Phillipsburg, Germany to pack their belongings. Neighbors gathered at the station as the humiliated Jewish families were forced to board trains destined for a detention camp in France. Manfred Wildman and his family were among the Jewish Germans deported from Phillipsburg that day. Phillipsburg, Bildman describes how one neighbor among the crowd reached out. For these who came to tell us that we had one hour to pack our bags and to leave. We paid to leave. We had to be told where we were going. I remember him once he told us don't take too much because you have to carry it on time to which my mother responded we can only sew that then so uh, we uh, we were taken the next uh, i mean an hour later to the main square of the town and the truck was there we were put on that truck to be taken away of course the whole town was assembled around it looking the Jews leaving, and people we knew. And one woman had the courage to come out and embrace my mother, to say goodbye. Nothing happened to her. If more people had done something like that, things may have changed. Is there anything in Mr. Vilden's testimony that caught your attention? Um, yep. The woman who embraced his mother. And what happened to her? Nothing. How does that help us disrupt the narrative that many students bring into the classroom? It's a common misconception that when you see a person that would speak up for sure culture for Jewish people, but automatically they take them there's this common belief that you know to, to speak out, to do anything, you know, would automatically result in some kind of negative action. So for many in Manfred's family, it was the last time that they would see their home. Within three years, his mother, father, and brother were all murdered in the Auschwitz killing center. Manfred Bildman recalls that deportation, saying that it was one woman that had the courage to come out and embrace her. Nothing happened to her. At 8 o'clock, policemen came. So here we're going to turn to a topic a little closer to us, educators and students. So if I were to ask you, what was the role of educators in the Third Reich? What do you think most people understand about schooling in the Third Reich? Yeah. Anything else? What was the role of teachers? What were they expected to do? Yeah. 
Implied, yeah. Indoctrinate. It's a great word. Any other ideas? Well, during the years leading up to World War II and the Holocaust, teachers often embraced these racist ideas promoted by the Nazis, some because they were true believers, others because it was simply easier to follow along. Many taught racism in their classrooms and even targeted their own <coughs> students. A small number chose to speak out against Nazi rule or help vulnerable young people. Here, a crowd gathers in Malzbach, Germany during Kristallnacht, the days-long wave of violence and terror against Jews in Germany and German annexed territories in November 1938. German officials describe these actions as being justifiable. Um, and a spontaneous response to German population to the assassination of a German diplomat, a fi diplomatic official, Ernst von Rath in Paris. This unprecedented violence against the Reich's Jews generated international outrage. In this image, sacred objects from local synagogue are ready for burning while school children of all ages assemble with the group. Do they look scared? Do they look nervous? No. So some non-Jewish teachers and students did far more than watch during Kristallnacht. Encouraged by teachers and leaders, school groups and Nazi youth organizations helped stage this and similar acts intended to intimidate and humiliate Jews in Germany. I hope that by now you wonder about the motivations and the agency of those involved. This is Rosa Marks. She didn't feel the sting of anti-Jewish hate in the classroom until 1938 in the wake of Kristallnacht. Nazi officials declared it intolerable for German school children to sit in a classroom shared with Jews. After Kristallnacht, Rosa returned to school and a letter to When I moved back with my parents, I um, was thinking, of course, about school. And um, I knew that I'd heard that Jewish children could no longer mix with the Christians to attend school. So I knew I would have to return my, my books to, to the class that I was attending. So I went to see my classroom teacher, who was whom I absolutely adored. She was cultural, she was intelligent, she was everything you can admire in a person. When she saw me, she said to me, where have you been? I said, I've been in prison. In prison? What did you do? I said, fuck now, I didn't do anything. I was always an excellent student, she knew that, and what could I have done? So she said to me, well, if you didn't do anything, at least your father must have owed income taxes. And, and that's probably why you were in jail. I said, fuck, no, my father never owed income tax. He always paid what he was supposed to. And I said to myself, how can this intelligent, cultured woman come to a conclusion that maybe if my father would have owed income taxes, that was a reason to put a 14-year-old girl into jail. Now this is the mentality we were dealing with. The girls in the classroom, who had some of them had been my best friends, just completely ignored me. They put their head down or looked elsewhere. And I was considered an outcast. I just was zero. I think that part really was the greatest shock, that you can be close friends with somebody, that you can trust the person and suddenly that they will turn against you just because you're Jewish. So if we apply the same lens that we use with the images, we can move away from the idea that Rosa's teacher was simply someone who was in the background of her story. Rosa had long been the only Jewish student in the class, but she had close friendships with her non-Jewish classmates. 
She saw Frachtenauer as a trusted role model. She describes her as cultured, intelligent, and everything you could admire. Yet we see the teacher carry some assumptions. If Rose had been in prison, she or her father must have done something wrong. As observers, we're left to wonder what motivations, experiences, or pressures influenced her teacher's views and allowed her to rationalize them. Further, we can wonder about Rosa's classmates as well. If their teacher had responded differently, would they have put their heads down and ignored Rosa? What role did her teacher play in creating a climate where anti-Semitism could flourish? The teacher was hardly a bystander in Rosa's story. She made a choice about how to respond. Like many other Jewish people in Germany, Rosa and her family were terrified after Kristallin. Her parents obtained a visa for Rosa to travel to the United States and live with relatives, but they were unable to find a visa for themselves. German authorities transported them to the wood jet ghetto in occupied Poland in 1941. They did not survive. Well, we can't know the answers to the questions that these photos and testimony prompts what we can wonder about the motivations towards certain behaviors, and the questions themselves are very informative. Meet Hannah Altbush. She also returned to school after Kristallnacht. Her experiences were a little different. Two. Uh, no, November after Kristina, I the day after, uh, I, I got up in the morning, I said, I'm going to school. And uh, my mother said, I don't know, you know, how are you going to be received? And I said, I am going to school. I'm going to face them all. I'm going to show them all that I'm coming to school. By this time, I was angry. I was scared, but I was also very angry. And I told Elsa I'm going, and she said she's coming with me. So the two of us went to school the next morning. And uh, the effect on the, all the students there was very strange because they wanted to show us that they were with us. Our desks were filled with fruit and candy. Um, there was very, very little attention in that morning. It was a very short morning, as I will uh, shortly explain. Um, and the, but there was a break where we went outside, and the entire class kind of put us in the middle, and they all joined the arms, and they all walked with us in, in the yard. I recall that she was angry, determined to go to school. I'm going to face them all. Yet when she and her sister arrive at school, they find their classmates want to show support rather than distrust, compassion for them. Their desks are covered with fruit and candy. When they go outside, their classmates join arms and walk with them. Hannah doesn't mention her teacher, as Rosa did, but we have to believe that he or she at least allowed, if not supported, those actions was different about this community. So that support and caring were fostered rather than distrust and hatred. Again, we come back to think about the choices that people are making. This is a photo taken in the spring of 1942 in Norway at the Fallstadt concentration camp. It shows a group of Norwegian teachers imprisoned for their refusal to join in the Nazi Teachers Association. Lots of questions. Mm -hmm. This is what we do know. In February 1942, Prime Minister Viko Kiesling demanded compulsory membership in Norway's National Teachers Union under German occupation. In response, Norway, the Norwegian Department of Education was flooded with letters of protest, including letters from parents. Within two months, 90% of Norway's 14,000 teachers resigned from the union, making the edict very ineffectual. After almost three months of humiliation, forced resignations, 
loss of pay, torture, and other forms of maltreatment, it was obvious to the authorities that nothing was going to break the solidarity of the teachers. On April 25th, 1942, the decree ordering the dismissal of teachers refusing to join the union was repealed. In May, the schools reopened and teachers were gradually released from prison. Although they were no longer required to belong to the union, they were still expected to teach Nazi ideology. And therefore, many teachers refused to return to work. 700 arrested teachers from eastern Norway were transported to a military training ground near Lillehammer in a grueling 14-hour train ride in open coal cars without food. The teachers were ordered out in the middle of the night, 10 miles from their destination and made to march the rest of the way. Those who collapsed were whipped or kicked in order to proceed. After reaching the training ground, they were given a slice of bread for breakfast and then put through a series of exhausting physical exercises, drills, and marches. Those who lagged behind or hesitated were made to crawl on their stomachs through ice, water, snow, and slush with their hands tied behind their backs. Some were given the task of carrying snow on a table fork or a broom handle or simply moving wood piles back and forth. All this meant to break the spirit of the group. But even after being subjected to such harsh conditions, the majority of teachers remained firm. Those who gave in typically had family responsibilities, meaning children, spouse, ill, and simply had to get home. The prisoners were paraded outside the barracks occupied by the Nazis in charge of the camp. The first man to be called in to sign the statement of apology was a sickly, rather elderly teacher who had sole responsibility for his children. The others had let him know that there would be no reproaches if he signed it. He dragged himself up the steps. Two or three minutes passed. He came out to the platform at the top of the steps, a completely new man. Standing in front of the other 700, he clenched his fist and shouted, I bloody well didn't sign! Then he went back to his place, and after that, it wasn't easy for any of the others to get in either. For students, we want them to know that choice was possible. In a wider range of choices and responses that most of them have previously considered. We examine the choices that people made to help reinforce the idea that choice was possible, but it presents a huge challenge because we know that so few people actually made those choices. But it reframes the existing simple narrative that people were brainwashed, they were forced. They acted only based on fear and would have been killed if they didn't go along. The question then is, why didn't this is where we can begin to have those really rich, contextually based discussions. Knowing that many teachers don't have a deep background in the Holocaust, genocide, or human rights education, and may not have more than a day or two to cover these instances in class, what does it mean for instruction, though? Well, first, we try to translate those statistics into people. Many people actively participate in the stigmatization the isolation, impoverishment, and violence culminating in the mass murder of six million European Jews. Many others supported the participants from the sidelines, tolerated their actions, or benefited from them. Still others disapproved of what they witnessed, sometimes silently, sometimes by publicly speaking out, and sometimes helping the victims in lesser or greater ways. So we try to choose photos, testimonies, and documents that examine the stories as of individuals and look at the community level, asking how do communities break down or support their neighbors. The number six million is incomprehensible. It's a story of an individual that's eminently understandable. Second, we try to strive for balance in establishing the perspective the photos, films, memos about the Holocaust overwhelmingly come from the perspective of the perpetrators for a very simple reason, they're the ones who survived. In the contrast, survivor testimonies and collections humanize the individuals in the richness and fullness of their lives. 
In the online exhibit and posters that have some were neighbors, there's several unique testimonies from witnesses and perpetrators that bring perspectives most haven't heard before. It raise a host of questions about the active and passive roles of ordinary people in everyday walks of life. And for me, as an English teacher, a lot of it comes down to precision of language. Words that categorize human behavior often have multiple meanings. The term bystander, for many people, carries this connotation of passivity. Even the term witness, while more active, is broad in scope. A person may have witnessed Jews being let out of town or witnessed Jews being shot by police. Neither tells us much about the relationship that existed, though. Either could have been a close neighbor or a Nazi official. By focusing more on precise language, which is informed by what we can see or hear, such as supportive classmates, opportunistic neighbor, sympathetic policemen, we steer students away from the temptation to generalize and distort the facts. And along with this, trying to avoid stereotypical descriptions. Though all Jews were targeted for destruction by Nazis, the experiences of all Jews were not the same. We try to remind students that although members of a group may share common experiences and beliefs, generalizations of them without the benefit of modifying or qualifying terms can stereotype group behavior and distort historical reality. Not all Germans can be characterized as Nazis, nor should any nationality be reduced to a singular or one-dimensional description. Finally, contextualizing the history. Events of the Holocaust, and particularly how individuals and organizations behave at the time, should be placed in historical context. The Holocaust should be studied in the context of European history as a whole to give students a perspective on the precedents and circumstances that may have contributed to it. Only then can students truly apply critical thinking. The skills we want to foster begin to create more meaningful experiences and understanding from the myriad of facts that are presented. In closing, I'd like to leave you with this reflection from Holocaust scholar Raoul Hilbert. At crucial junctures, every individual makes decisions, and every decision is individual. In the context of the Holocaust, or for many of you, genocide, mass atrocities, this becomes magnified. Inviting students to consider the choices made by individuals challenges students to Think about the lesser known and understood aspects of these histories. Urges them to consider their own actions and responsibilities in contemporary life. Their responsibilities to their neighbors, their responsibilities to their community, as well as deepening their understanding. that you might have. Yeah. From your understanding, are they just not both aware of the whole sort of like timeline for the, um, the Holocaust, or do they think like, you know, they're just translating them to like a work camp, they don't understand that's like a work camp for them? It's a great question. Um, and so I mean, and again, I mean, that's, um, people often, you know, think about the Holocaust as being kind of this, this you know, plan that was hatched right from the beginning. The reality was that it kind of evolved as it went along. In Germany and Austria, I mean, they, they stripped away the citizenship from the Jewish people. After the beginning of World War II, um, obviously there was, you know, segregating the Jewish people from the rest of the population, so these, these ghettos evolved, in which they were sectioning off portions of cities. Conditions were absolutely terrible in the ghettos. People starved to death, they were victims of violence, disease was rampant, but still this codified, you know, uh, murder wasn't really thought of yet. It's with Operation Barbarossa when the German military moved into the Soviet Union and suddenly there were three to three and a half you know, more Jews that, there, that they were suddenly confronted with and three million communists that they were coming into contact with that these open air murders perpetrated by the Einsatzgruppen started to begin in earnest. Um, and it was felt that Wow, this is overwhelming for our troops, and the idea that you know they could bring them all together to 
you know, these concentrated centers for the mass murder, that's when that idea began to evolve. So, I mean, it, it's a complex answer. I mean, so as things evolved, was the Gestapo aware of this? Yes, very likely. And they were instrumental in making that happen. Yes? Um, first, I wanted to thank you for taking the time to come speak with us today. Uh, sure. Secondly, I wanted to ask, in the purview of your um, talk today, how do you believe that the ability to make choices reflects in the field's ability to make the determination between who was a perpetrator and who was simply a bystander? One of the things you mentioned is um, that Rose's teacher was hardly a bystander, but there are so many instances in which that ability to make the choice eventually filters into what was the, um, as Hilbert describes it, the destruction, the mechanism of destruction of the Jewish population. And so how then do we as practitioners determine that fine line between what is a perpetrator and what is a bystander? Yeah, that's a great question. And one that I mean that we struggle with, whether in the research art of the museum, education, you know, exhibits and stuff like that. Um, and generally, I mean, it comes down to, I mean, it's, it's not for us to decide I mean, obviously, there's, you know, like, Rudolf Huss, Commandant of Auschwitz. Yeah, pretty clearly a perpetrator. Um, but yet, for people that fall on this spectrum, um, we know that there were, I mean, if we think about the boat rescue in Denmark, in which essentially, you know, this, you know, committed Nazi essentially flips and, you know, tells, you know, the leadership in Denmark, you might want to get your people out of here. I mean, yeah, we would probably, you know, consider him to be a perpetrator, but does he also do good in that role? And so I guess that in trying to get away from these kind of static categories, um, and it's really those things we want to you know, challenge people to think about more. Um, we think about like you know, the, the nurses and medical professionals that were at you know, the, the T4 um, centers where they were you know, before the concentration camps were got going, and they were murdering the disabled people in Germany. I'm thinking about you know complicity there, you know is someone you know, more complicit because they were signing off on it, or more complicit because they were opening the valve on the CO2, um, and so it's a lot of times it's up to the individual, you know to think in their own mind, you know how complicit was this person? It's it's a hard question. I mean, and you know still I mean after years of struggling with these things, it's you know just trying to to think of things along spectrum rather than, than you know, coming up with absolute answers. That's a really unsatisfying answer, I realize. But that's, that's what we have. Yeah? Uh, yeah, thank you for coming here, Mr. Parker. Sure. Um, I was just wondering if you had insight onto why the Norwegians were more resilient than the German teachers. Um, and within, like, day-to-day -day jobs, and also, like, you know, Someone, because like a teacher is a position of authority, mm -hmm. how does that influence like how we should act if we were in those positions of authority? Yeah. So I do have an answer to. Um, so when we look at you know in, in a place like Norway, they knew what was coming. They had an opportunity to organize. They had an opportunity to form communities to come to consensus about how they were going to respond. And essentially, you know, the idea was that we are not going to give in. That they're at the goal and professional responsibilities were stronger, and they met a lot, you know, essentially to say that we are stronger standing together. We understand that, that, you know, if you choose to do this, that's on you, but we are going to attempt to stand together for this. Uh, and as far as, you know, about, you know, ethics in today's, you know, world, because it's hard not to see some of these echoes and to think about the process and policies that we see playing around us. Um, you know, trying to think about the context of what was going on in the 1930s and 40s in Germany and what we see going on around us now. Um, and it comes to that idea that, I mean, the, ultimately the person we have to answer to is ourselves. The person that we see looking back at the mirror. Um, and just considering, okay, so what are the repercussions of this? What could happen as a response? Um, you know, how comfortable am I doing, you know, to, to stand up? Obviously, we hope that most people would think that their responsibility to their neighbor, to their community, extends beyond themselves. And that it might be easier to do this, but I have an obligation to do this. I hope that helps. Yes? 
So you spent a long time in the classroom uh, with high school students in particular and their kind of vital time of coming to wrap their heads around what the Holocaust was and what the implications were. You, uh, a lot of the time it's the only sort of understanding that people ever get as to this concept of mass atrocity prevention. Um, were there any concepts in particular that you found frustrating or difficult to have students wrap their minds around? Um, and what did you kind of learn in your 20 years of teaching? I think probably the most difficult things for most students, and I think for society as a whole, is how the hell could this have happened to people? I mean, this is, you know, a Western, modern, industrialized country. I mean, you know, and that, you know, Hitler was, you know, time man of the year in 1936. I mean, he's being lauded by a good chunk of the world for the economic recovery that was going on in Germany. How does this kind of thing happen? And that's probably the question we get asked by teachers the most and that students are, are frustrated by. Um, and you know, just thinking about, and then trying to, to weave in you know, some of those concepts of anti-Semitism. Uh, we've been doing work with um, a lot of teachers in Title I schools, schools that don't have the economic resources that a lot of um, other schools have. But it accounts for about 58% of schools across the nation and uh, time and time again, we hear from really educated people that they, you know, bring together these concepts. Oh, Nazism and anti-Semitism. You know, yes, it was the, the central pillar of Nazism. And there's this, you know, thought that anti-Semitism pretty much started around the same time without, you know, the understanding that anti-Semitism is millennia old. Um, and so I think for, for students, the toughest stuff to, to, to wrap their minds around is obviously how this happened, but this influenced it, this influenced it, this thing from 2,000 years ago influenced it, this action, you know, that this corporation, you know, supported this. And, you know, instead of seeing it along, as I said at the beginning, this nice, simple, neat, linear narrative, the understanding it's this, this globe that has these, you know, extensions going in up off in all these different directions. Sometimes when I work with groups of pre-service students, uh, pre-service teachers, I ask them, like, how many of you remember your mandated French Revolution education? Come on, you have to know about the dangers of neo-Jacobian thought, right? <laughs> you all know the months of the French Revolutionary calendar, right? My favorite was Thunderdorm, <laughs> just because it's a really cool name. Y you all know about the uh, Robespierre. So why are we expected to know six million? Why are we expected to know Auschwitz as these real central things? And when you know, they talk about you know, the knowledge of this, and you know, we focus on learning about rather than from and through, and, and to you know, help students gain understanding by looking at primary documentation, by reading you know, diaries, by you know, looking at you know, the range of people that were involved in this and really trying to you know, go you know, push towards meaning and understanding. Um, and so it, it's tough because I mean some students they, they see this education it's like Holocaust education it, like it has its own name. It's like oh history, English, science, oh Holocaust education and you know how many other topics have you know mandates at the state level for this and if you compare any two of the mandates None of them read anywhere near the same, and yet they're supposed to cure students of some of these ills. And so it's hard, you know, for students to, to enter into this, you know, particularly because there's so much weight that gets put on it. So I don't know if that really answered your question. Um, I hope so. And yes. I, I, I'm sorry to jump in, but I, I'm yeah. a high school teacher as well, and like year after year, uh, we, we wrestle with this. A lot of our students. The Holocaust for high schoolers is sort of a symbol of evil. So to us in whatever, 1990, 2000, 2010, my students always thought it would be clear cut. You know, like clear evil that which you should oppose. But in your presentation, I thought you made it very clear that it was very foggy and unclear for a lot of people at the time. You know, like that one teacher who froze the kid out. She, that, I imagine that teacher was in a moral conundrum. What do I do? versus the other classroom who embraced the other student coming back. And so I know that my students wrestling with this question, 
they kind of saw it almost as a video game. Like, well, why didn't you resist at the time? Because it's obvious what's going to happen. It wasn't obvious. It was very unclear. The first video, you know, don't pack too much. They had no idea what was going to happen to them. So I, I'm sorry to jump in, but I know for my students, it was the confusion of it because in retrospect, it feels like a symbol, like almost like the ultimate, you know, like evil thing of the 20th century. But at the time, it's really hard, I think, to understand how confusing everything was at the time, at least for my students. I mean, you speak really well to the, the, the paradox of it. The, at the same time, while we want to make sure it's studied in context and that those other things are understood, it, it is a watershed moment in history. It needs to be understood as the Holocaust, but it doesn't happen without you know, the layers of World War II and these other events going on around it. Well, I just, I because I think, you know, I think you say that is, we don't deal well with incremental change. <laughs> you know, we deal well with epics and, and catastrophic moments and, and very reified concepts, but I think it's much more difficult, you know, based on what you're saying, to capture the nuances that, that this didn't just suddenly happen. It was, as you said, a, a, a millennium in the making. Um, so um, I was just wondering, I, I just, I don't know if you have an answer to this, but I'm just, your thoughts on this, because um, right now it's very politically charged, and, and, and teachers are really under the gun right now, and literally, I mean, yeah, in classrooms. So. And what I'm struggling with is, um, you know, the idea that we make our uh, personal, we make choices. And, and I think looking, studying the Norwegian teachers and how they organize, and then they acted as a collective, which I think is powerful too. That that you have to build community. Yeah. That it's it's harder to do that as an individual. But right now we're dealing a lot with like uh, teachers refusing to to refer to a, student, uh, a student by their chosen name. They object to transgender identities, and so. They're making a personal choice to resist. And we have you know, groups from the right rallying them as kind of freedom fighters. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I just, I don't know what your thoughts are of how do you, how do you experience about trying to reason through that, the qualitative difference between choosing not to be a bystander in the face of potential of violence in, in this, as opposed to teachers now being um, you know, celebrated for choosing to to refuse to teach. I mean, that's it, yeah. really important. And I mean, what, what you speak to is you know, kind of that, that idea of politics of the big P and you know, politics of the little P, you know, those, those local politics and you know, the, the big state and you know, federal policies. Um, that, I mean, right now there are 36 or 37 states that have passed legislation in the past couple of years you know, some of them under the banner of anti-CRT. Um, some of them, you know, focusing on issues of divisive language. Some of them rolling in the, oh, you have to look at both sides of an issue. Um, and what some of them seem to gloss over that sometimes there is not another side. Sometimes there's historical truth. And attempts to undermine that veracity um, is damaging to all of us. You know, society as a whole, asking people to you know, to, to start to unravel things that are well understood and that are absolute truths. Um, and so when, and certainly in the age of social media, when things get simplified and crystallized memes, there can be massive misunderstandings um, and what it means to be standing up for yourself. Um, it's, you know, it comes back to almost that, that, that paradox of, of tolerance that you know to be too tolerant is to you know is to be not tolerant at all uh, and it's it, it's it's challenging um, and the, the impact that it's had on teachers um, is really disturbing you know, particularly when we see the number of teachers that are you know leaving the occupation um, it's like you know every year the, the museum runs professional development for teachers and you know we see that you know it, it's generally teachers that are secure in their positions that you know have freedoms in their classrooms are the ones that are attending this and it's a lot of younger teachers and, um, and you know, we're trying to attract them because I probably worked with close to a thousand pre service teachers in my couple of years at the museum now and just the constant straight over again there's a lot of people that don't want to touch this with 
you know, a, a ten foot pole simply because the topic can be so polarizing. Um, Anti-Semitism is often, you know, talked about in the, those hushed conversations as being a divisive topic. Um, I hope that answers. Thank you. Sure. Ah, thank you so much for your amazing presentation. Um, I wanted to know uh, why is this important to you, us getting this information and being aware of what's happening? Sure. I mean, I, I guess, you know, personally, because I, I think it's, I mean, I'm, I'm an educator at heart. I mean, I, I, mean, I, I, I love working with students. Um, the position I, I have at the museum, you know, just affords me lots of, lots of opportunities to, to help create. Um, and I think that there's a lot that people, not just you know, students, but you know, society can learn through thinking about and you know, considering and trying to learn from the worst of human behavior. Um, and that there are, there's important lessons that we can take out of that. We can take the time to step back and consider what it means. I mean, what were these? What was going on at the time? What informed their actions? And what do we see going on around us now? Uh, it's not something I've really thought about. Um, I, it's just one of those narratives that's become, you know, kind of ingrained in society that, yep, America entered the war, and you know, we kicked everyone's ass, and you know, World War II came to an end then, and you know, things were good, and we know very, it was very much the opposite. I don't know how much that's, you know, um, been fueled or fuels um, white nationalism. Um, that's a question I'd ask in my office. Yep. Um, so I'm curious about the translation of the guidelines that you were talking about into like discussing current and ongoing modes of property. So I was specifically thinking about like the role of individual complexity in terms of being like a consumer who's potentially like funding like weaker forced labor and discussing like the role of individual guilt, but also the concept that like an individual child isn't necessarily necessarily or at all responsible for a genocide that's happening, but the role that they're playing in buying those from places like mm H&M -hmm. and these other um, companies are, is contributing to that risk of so. Yeah, great point. Um, and so while the, the, uh, the guidelines for teaching are written as being very Holocaust specific, um, they're certainly mean the philosophical concepts behind them, I mean, essentially about good teaching. Um, and so to be able to you know, apply them to different instances, and whether we're talking about instances of mass atrocity, genocide, child labor, you know, instances of slavery. I mean, it's, we need to understand the context of what's going on. We should absolutely have good definitions of what we mean when we say something. We, and you know, to understand you know, the faces, the names, of what's going on is absolutely important. So, yeah, I, I absolutely agree. Yes. What do you think is the contribution of the program, especially when it comes to the policy influencing? And uh, how do you recommend, like, in the post uh, genocide country, like, to, to implement the curricula, uh, how complex the letter is, especially when you have uh, uh, communities which is uh, made again by former. Uh, members of the perpetrators or the survivors, how do you look at that situation to, 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 to be implemented in the post war But also, how do you, do you look at the impact and influence of the program to the national policy? Yeah. Unfortunately, I'm very not well equipped to answer that question. Um, the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum is a federal institution. Most of our um, outreach vast majority of our programs are done on U.S. soil. Um, the work that we do internationally um, is 
usually not in the realm of education. Um, so I don't have a very good answer for it. I'm sorry. <coughs> I mean, in terms of the politics involved, it's certainly a synergistic effect. I mean, the Nazis played and preyed upon existing prejudices. Um, Anti-Semitism had existed in Europe for thousands of years, uh, and they certainly fanned its flames. Um, in terms of, you know, just the, uh, the legislation, it was well planned out. Um, certainly, I... April 1st, 1933, there was a, uh, they uh, tried to, uh, they, they uh, essentially did a one-day boycott of Jewish stores and Jewish businesses. Um, they found German society wasn't quite ready for that kind of radical step yet because many people made it a point to shop at those businesses just out of spite. And so the Nazi party understood philosophically that they had more work to do. Um, and so they began to, to focus on communists in their midst, and they found that was more palatable. And so then they started to implement some of these same measures and to certainly fan those flames of existing anti-Semitism until they found that the ground was a little riper for them. Um, and you know, these legislations came along. Um, I don't, uh, are, are you a method student by any chance? Are, are you a... a Research teacher by any chance? Okay, uh, I was gonna say, I mean, there's a, uh, a timeline that you can get on the museum's website that, that shows the legislation, you know, all these laws, everything that were put into effect and the years they were put into effect. And then, you know, you, you see later on, years after, it's when they came and they were, the fulfilling of them was intense. Yes? Uh, so, as you're talking about, like, laws in place, or not necessarily laws, just like that, like societal pressures at the time, like I just can't help but like mention like at the same time it's Jim Crow laws in the United States oh, yeah. and all this stuff is going on, why do you think the world's response to like condemning the Nazis was different instead of condemning the U.S.? Yeah, I mean, so, it's hard. Um, in, and there's been a lot of study done on this by people far more knowledgeable than I. Um, we do know that Nazi jurists came to America to study Jim Crow laws and how Americans had segregated and isolated um, communities of color. Um, and they actually took some of their ideas from the US to implement their own laws and legislation. Um, the, what the, one of the outstanding differences, though, is the radical change that took place in Germany and Europe at the time, where has it been, well, I hate to use the word accepted, but I can't think of a better, uh, institutionalized, I, I can't think of a, a good word for it right now, um, but it was understood that that's the way America was, um, and America wasn't making a large imperialistic or you know colonialist you know moves at that point you know, they were very isolationist um, at the beginning of you know World War II America had the 17th biggest you know military in the world they were very closed in um, I don't know if you happen to anyone happen to see the uh, the first episode of America in the Holocaust uh, last night film by Ken Burns. Um, part part one's being rerun tonight. Um, and parts two and three are uh, tomorrow and Wednesday. It's fascinating. Is it coincidence that he's doing that topic at the same time the 
Holocaust Memorial Museum is in the middle of the project of collecting newspaper information. Nope, not coincidental at all. Okay. Um, six, seven years ago, um, by coincidence, uh, Ken Burns and one of our researchers, Danny Green, okay. um, happened to be in the same place at the same time, looked over his shoulder, saw it was on a computer screen, mm -hmm. and wow, that's really interesting. What can you tell me about this? Um, and it just kind of rolled on from there. Um, and so while, again, uh, as a federal institution, there's some places that the museum cannot go. Um, Ken Burns is quite able to go in some of those directions, and so the museum is is happy to you know supply archival materials, research, and you know support the development of the film. Um, one of my good friends, uh, Dr. Rebecca Belding, um, was a uh, key in the development of this. Um, so yeah, it's it's fascinating stuff. Um, so the, uh, the the commentary being made is. I'm sorry, I didn't interrupt oh, no, the question that you were working on in yeah. terms of the connection between two films. Yeah, so I mean, yeah, there are there are definite connections between uh, America's past um, and the actions taken by the Nazis. Um, Susan Neiman writes a fascinating book that looks at uh, America's ability to confront its own past of slavery and um, how the Germans are confronting their past of the Nazis. So. Mm -hmm. So we were taking a bit about how like um you know, I'm sure just from Holocaust. I think a lot of students, especially like in secular school, might like, find that in addition. Um, do you think not just having this medic or anything, but do you think it's specific tenet of Judaism that makes everything so targeted, or do you think that it was the um not something that existed for millennia that has made that easy for the Germans to um, to like prey on that I don't know, I mean it's 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 Things that get ingrained in society. I mean, there are comments that you know we all make without even realizing that they might be anti-Semitic or racist in some way, simply because it, it permeates the very air that we breathe around us. Um, for uh, the Nazis, I mean, they understood it was fertile ground that could be brought back up. Um, Hitler, obviously, was an anti-Semite. Um, he brought that with him. He found people that believed similarly to him. As far as contemporary anti-Semitism, it it's a much more challenging question, um, and you know, so when it comes back to, I mean, there are probably can't believe, but you you wouldn't believe the number of students, you know, or, or teachers that met and worked with that never met a Jewish person, and so they just don't have any idea, any conception what it means, and so whether there's particular tenets of Jewish belief, I don't think so. I think it's just, you know, misunderstanding and ignorance creates fear. And that's the other problem. Do you think also that, you know, you mentioned Hitler was an anti-Semite, obviously. Um, do you think it was his subjugation of the Jewish people that was really instrumental in his rise of power? Like, do you think that without putting these other people down, he would have been able to change the change of the table without government? Wow. Um, he knew the strings to pull. Um, as, I mean, he surrounded himself with people that believed as he did. Um, certainly, when he first, you know, um, you know, with the beer hall butch and you know, you know, being sent to prison, writing Mein Kampf and everything. I mean, he was in a country that was nowhere near ready to accept or embrace his beliefs. They were instrumentalized in the a sense of that putting other people down and you know brought opportunities for me. Um, so that was a lot of the buy in there. It's not that you know many of the people in Germany were anti Semitic to begin with. They became anti Semitic through their actions. <coughs> yeah. I have um, one more question and maybe just an insight from you. Um, with the recent development, the fast development of media technology, we can almost feel like that all of us are bystanders, considering that there are so many atrocities around the world. And um, for the teachers, when they are teaching this concept and showing the pictures, those are great ways to show them that maybe the balconies are not there. You can look through your balcony and you might not see 
is happening in your balcony, but you can visit your Facebook page, your social media pages, and it can tunnel window for for so many of us. So my question is, how do you recommend the teachers to sort of mobilize their students to actions and while well, not trying not to give them extra guilt and protecting their mental health, what are the implications, those actions that people like us can take to not be a bystander? Yeah. That's something I struggle with, and I still struggle with it. We get you know, questions from teachers all the time about that, about you know turning knowledge into action. Um, a lot of it comes down to knowing who your students are. I mean, you may be a very quiet student from a very conservative family that to retweet something is an enormous act of courage on their part. Um, for another student that has a lot of resources that grew up in a very liberal household, you know, to start an organization, you know, to do a lot of outreach and, you know, raise money for this, that actually may not be nearly as big a step as it was for you know, one student to simply share something that goes completely, that is diametrically opposed to the household they were brought up in. And so, I mean, it, when we think about knowledge to action, it, it, it really just comes down to understanding the students, who they are and what we're asking of them. Because some of our, our students, you know, come from places where they witness violence in front of them every day. You know, they may not have had a good meal. Um, they don't have any basis, you know, to understand this history from. And so, when we bring you know, a lot of this weight in, sometimes it can you know, they just recoil from it. And so it, it just comes down to understanding who the students are and how am I going to teach it this year? Thank you. Yeah. Yes. You mentioned that there are obviously a lot of people who have never been through learned on the Holocaust or something like that. And there's also so many people are out of school anymore. So. How do you believe would be the best way to go about educating or closing the doors? And of course, like that's the job of the museum. But do you feel that it's more useful or, um, or helpful to try to connect with them on an informational level or on an empathetical level? Well, I think one of the best ways to do it is what actually what is being championed here. You know, having it understood, you know, that the Holocaust impacted all facets of life. It impacted law, the military, medicine, education, you know, industry. It impacted everything. So that you know, when you know people are going through education, that the ethical questions that the Holocaust brings up, you know, aren't ignored, um, and that they can be placed in that context. But you know, a lot of it has to do with people are being you know, educated, how they're being trained, um, the conversations that they're willing to have. Um, and so I think museums play a really important role in having the public come in and understand. Um, but I mean, so out of the questions we've asked close to, boy, 5,000 teachers over the past three summers in some virtual programming, the number has stayed ridiculously constant that 24% of students come into their classrooms, usually 8th grade English class with Anne Frank or 10th grade social studies with uh, you know, world history um, without knowing what the Holocaust was or really having any basis of understanding about it. But I mean, history education keeps getting, its value keeps getting pushed down. So, you know, more about it, there's like about the fourth test, I don't have a great answer for you. But I mean, it's just <laughs> kind of the way it is. I mean, and it's, it's uh, you know, just keep doing the, you know, the drop of the bucket. I'll, you know, just try to do the best I can, and then you know, I work with an amazing you know, team of people that are you know, trying to reach out in different ways as well. One of my colleagues, you know, she works with the military and law enforcement. So I'm certainly the, uh, you know, the Scott Center for the Prevention of Genocide. I mean, it's just keep on trying. Yes, one um, more question. Uh, so I'm wondering if you could design the education curriculum 
at what age you think would be good? Because you talked about contextualizing history, and that's a very important point because a lot of people have the perception that the Holocaust was like a single event. So things build up within a decade, and you know that was centuries before with the anti-Semitism. So how far back do you think we should go, or at what age would implement start teaching children about history and building it up to a point where they can understand like a broader, or get a broader perspective? So a lot of the building blocks can be started in preschool. I mean, teaching about you know fairness, equity, all those, you know, the, the, the human rights, um, social justice concepts. They should be addressed. They should be built into, to, you know, early education. Um, as students get older, I mean, certainly those ideas become more complex. Um, when students start to get into, you know, middle school, seventh, eighth grade, yeah, the specifics of the Holocaust can start being addressed because, I mean, we just know from, you know, how their minds develop as they mature that, you know, it gets to that point where they can understand, you know, they uh, can begin to, to think about those concepts more deeply. Um, but it, for me, it's like, okay, so in English class, you know, they're studying, you know, Merchant of Venice, and you talk about the character Shylock. Why doesn't, you know, it doesn't take that much to spend, you know, three minutes talking about anti-Semitism, you know, there. Or in the social studies class, you know, talking about, you know, the Crusades and Pope Urban II, you know, telling the, the Crusaders that, you know, why are you going down there to, uh, Wipe them. You can wipe out every Jewish settlement along the way too. I mean, those things can be brought in so that when students do come face to face with the Holocaust in a class later on, that it's not like, oh yeah, I've heard about that that concept before, or I understood that this kind of idea has existed for a long time. That you know, it's this gradual you know ramp up to it, rather than oh wow, and then you know, and decontextualizing it, you know, bringing it out of the community. Okay, please join me in thanking Jeffrey Parker for joining us.